Welcome to my channel, Act on Mental Health, where we're learning acceptance and commitment therapy and its applications on mental health. One of the main reasons that I'm drawn to ACT is its focus on workability and integration of science, philosophy, and spirituality. As a pastor for 15 years, it was important for me to find a therapeutic modality that fit within my worldview and didn't feel like a compromise. In my graduate program, I devoted a lot of time to the integration of psychology and faith specifically reading, writing, and presenting my research uh, with in-class projects. This extra research led me into a rabbit hole akin to Alice in Wonderland, trying to make sense of the world and human behavior. A big part of this was reading original works from William James, C.S. Pierce, and Stephen Peppers. These authors contributed heavily to the philosophy that ACT derives from, called functional contextualism. Now, I'll admit, uh, philosophy isn't everyone's cup of tea, and absorbing the information and concepts can lead to migraines and mental fog. So you may want to grab a cup of coffee and continually sip throughout this video. This video is broken down into two sections. First, we're going to look at worldviews, assumptions, and root metaphors from Stephen Pepper's 1942 book. Next, we're going to look at the question, what is functional contextualism? My promise to you is to better inform you on the philosophical foundation of ACT and offer a compassionate worldview to use in therapy and in life. Before we go any further, this would be a great time to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Every view, like, and subscriber motivates me to make even better content the next time and also propels ACT to a larger audience on YouTube. In 1942, Stephen C. Peppers wrote a book called World Hypothesis that provides an overview of the four major hypotheses of philosophical theories, their assumptions about the world, and their root metaphors. Now, this may come as no surprise, but there's not one way to describe the world. This is referred to by Peppers as dogmatism, whose authority cannot be questioned. Often, religion fits within this category, which is not a slight on religious belief, only to indicate the different worlds between religion and science. In the 1940s, dogmatism dominated the divide between science and metaphysics, which usually meant religious beliefs. And it was quite popular to poo-poo metaphysics and discard it entirely from scientific discussion of what's true. Dogmatism basically takes two sides of a coin. So on one side, you could have the fanatic who believes despite evidence. To show its contrary. And then you have the extreme skeptic that will not believe no matter the evidence that's put before them. So we want to avoid dogmatism, and that's just looking at that one way of seeing the world and describing the world. Truth is defined by Peppers is derived from scientific data and logical data, but heavily influenced by one's interpretation of the world, or we would call this philosophical theory of the world. And instead of proving any one of these four world theories as supreme or correct, he simply describes them as adequate means to finding the truth. It really depends on what questions you're asking and what answers you're wanting to find. This is what it looks like in a diagram. You'll notice six arrows coming down. Two on the left are facts about the world and logic, inductive and deductive. Now, I'm not a philosopher, so if that's your background, feel free to inform me and the viewers on anything that you find important to the discussion. The four arrows on the right are Pepper's four world hypotheses. So let's consider each one briefly. Formism is the process of describing relations of facts and discriminating from other sets of facts to categorize and analyze data. The root metaphor is similarity. So we're trying to group things and categorize them. Next, we have mechanism. And this is the process of analyzing and describing how things work with all facts fitting together into a whole. The root metaphor here is a machine. Then we have contextualism, which is the process of synthesizing information into functional terms that describe courses of action. The root metaphor here is historical act or act in context. Then we have organicism. And this is the process of synthesizing patterns of relationships in the system of an organism. The root metaphor here is a living system. Now, each of these world hypotheses are used today, and they create a lot of divisions we see, whether scientific, medical, 
religious, or political. And while we can simply agree to disagree, or perhaps find a compromise, these are difficult to find. As moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt observed in his book, The Righteous Mind, that the human condition is to divide into teams that believe dogmatically that their one way of seeing the world is right and that they are righteous. And this obviously means the other team is unrighteous. It's also been said that the brain has two jobs, first to keep you alive and then to make you right. And I can't disagree with that. So the purpose here is not to reinforce how right we are or which team we're on, but to see the adequacy and inadequacy of all four world hypotheses. Functional contextualism is the philosophy that underlies acceptance and commitment therapy and much of the research that is behind relational frame theory as well as contextual behavioral science. Contextualism's root metaphor is the act in context. So the goal of functional contextualism is to synthesize the scientific data, what we can observe, as well as the logical data that we can deduce and induce to influence behavioral change. I know that's a mouthful, but basically it's asking, what is the function of behavior and how can we target that for change? Now, early behaviorism and early psychology was developed out of the formism and mechanism philosophies that saw humans as similar to animals, formism, and the brain and body as a machine or mechanism. This allowed many advances in scientific research, but it also propagated bad science due to their underlying assumptions of their root metaphors of similarity and machine. More modern examples of these two philosophical hypotheses are the DSM-5 and prescription medicine, which are based on the medical and disease model. Now, why is this important? Well, if we take the assumption of the medical model and disease model to their conclusion, we focus on treatment that either eliminates the problem or treats the symptoms rather than the causes. And this works great with biological causes, but not so great with problematic thinking or suffering. You can take the medication that reduces symptoms, but that won't solve your life problem. Likewise, you can label the dysfunctional behavior, but that doesn't lead to a more fulfilling life. Functional contextualism looks at the context in which behavior happens, not so much the form that the behavior takes or typography of behavior, so instead of labeling behavior as depression, we look at the context of the behavior as staying in bed with depressive thoughts and feelings of low energy and so on. This is the act and context that functional contextualism looks to synthesize. William James in the 18 and 1900s was a giant in the infancy of psychology prior to Freud and his revolutionary ideas at the time. William James and C.S. Pierce coined the term pragmatism which is closely linked with functional contextualism. Now, in their writings, they emphasize what works over what's true, which sidestepped a lot of the arguments at that time and was quite controversial, as you can imagine. Basically, what James and Pierce were saying is that psychologists are asking different questions than scientists, physicians, theologians, and politicians. There's not a single worldview that's going to answer every question being asked. Pragmatism, then, narrows its focus to answer a specific question in a specific context. So what's functional contextualism then? In short, this is the starting point for understanding and influencing behavior that provides the set of questions we're interested in answering. In philosophy, there is a truth criterion for every world hypothesis. For functional contextualism, it is the pragmatic truth criterion of does it work? In other words, workability is at the core of our pursuit of truth. This means we're not interested in answering other questions that other world hypothesis might be. We're not answering, how is this similar or different from other behaviors? Or how does this work in the machine of the brain? Or how does this part of the living system or organism come to be? You know, where does depression come from? You know, all those things are not as important. It's not that they're not important. It's just not what we're interested in answering to understand and influence behavior. I hope I said that right. It seemed kind of jumbled, but hopefully you get the point. To conclude this section, let's consider the ACT matrix developed by Kevin Polk. This has a horizontal axis and a vertical axis, and this helps us to plot behavior 
and assess workability for the client. So the horizontal line is observable behavior. This is what you and I can see. The vertical line is reportable behavior, what you observe about your experience. Now on the top here is the five senses, and on the bottom is our inner experiences, such as thoughts, emotions, and memories. Remember, we're only answering questions from a functional contextual position. So we're asking, what is the behavior? So we'd plot that on this graph. Then we would ask, well, what happens next? What's its consequence? And so this would give us the function that the behavior serves. Then we would ask, well, what happens before the behavior? What, what's kind of going on inside of you? What's happening in your environment? This would be asking, what's the antecedent? This gives us a good picture of understanding behavior, and then we can look at ways to influence behavior. Now, this graph can be divided on two sides. You have workability, and then you have workable. Now, this is not good or bad, because that's not helpful in answering our question. Workable refers to short-term responses that we've been conditioned to make, because it works. It gets us what we want. It gets us away from that experience or helps us in some way. Workability refers to responses based on long-term valued ends. These are things that we really are want to, to pursue. So all this comes together when we consider the context. The context clarifies to the client if this is working for them. What we'd like to see is the client moving toward their values by taking committed actions. However, at times it may not be workable depending on the context. For example, let's say that my value is lifelong learning and I've made a commitment to read this book. My value is learning, but the workability would be whatever book I decided to read, whenever I decided to read it, and wherever I decided to read it. The workability is flexible. However, if a bear shows up in the park that I decided to read my book to take committed action toward my value of lifelong learning, it would not be workable to stay in the line of danger. Therefore, the workable solution would be to move away from my value to preserve my life. Now, I said at the beginning that this is a compassionate approach. And what I mean by that is that it is empathetic to the client's situation and the difficult decisions that they have to make to move toward or away from their values. There's no judgment here because that's not helpful in answering the question that functional contextualism is interested in. As a therapist, I will continue to seek to understand the function of the behavior, the context in which it happens, and look for ways to influence behavior toward valued ends, taking committed action. In this video, we've covered a lot of ground, but hopefully you've gained a better sense of what functional contextualism is and how it influences the work done in ACT. Workability lies at the heart of ACT and is the cornerstone on which all the sick core processes are built to create a life of psychological flexibility. Thank you for investing your time in watching this video. If you'd like to learn more about ACT, then please leave a comment below or any questions that you have or suggestions for future videos. Remember, your journey towards a more purposeful and mindful life begins with a single click.